All right. Well, I think it's about that time. Let's get things kicked off this morning. Uh, my name is Tim Hamrich. I'm a communications consultant back in the forgotten I state of Idaho uh, out west here and very, very pleased to be moderating today's panel. And um, we have we kind of joked yesterday when we were uh, doing the final prep for this that we have probably four webinars here that we're going to get squeezed into one. So a lot of great information, no matter how you answered that full question about where you're at in terms of cover crops, there's going to be something in here that will be relevant to you. And we want, we really want to make sure that that's the case. Uh, we have our experts here and they do have some really valuable information planned, but we also want to make sure that we get to your questions uh, as well. So you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there should be a little Q&A icon. If at any point in the uh, presentation you have a question, just go ahead and put it right away right there rather than waiting till our Q&A section at the end, uh, because we want to capture as many of those as possible and get to as many of those as possible. Sometimes that might even be early in the presentation. But looking at the results of the poll here, really interesting. We have a, a pretty balanced breakdown. 38% of you answered zero to two years on cover crops, 23% uh, three to five years, and then 39% five plus years. So uh, really got a, a good balance and that's going to actually provide um, some great context for us. And I actually think we kind of planned for something similar. So I think it'll work out just fine. But we have four distinguished experts here that are all gonna go through different parts of uh, the cover crop termination process, as well as some just key insights into cover crops in general along the way. We have Sarah, Sarah Carlson, who is the Strategic Initiatives Director for the Practical Farmers of Iowa. She's also an agronomist and a cover crops expert. Uh, Mark Rohrbach, who's a no-till farmer, a pioneer seed sales rep, and the founder of Green Armor Seeds, which does consulting and sells cover crop seed. Uh, Ron Geis, who's market, a market development specialist in crop protection with Corteva AgriScience. And Eric Miller, who is with Pioneer Agronomy, um, and he's a field, uh, field rep, field agronomist for them. So we're going to try to... Uh, go fast and furious here, but do want to encourage you to use that Q&A function. Good. It looks like somebody already has. Pete, thank you for being a leader and uh, leaving us our first question. Please, the rest of you, join Pete uh, and leave some questions as we go along. But I do want to just dive right into this. And we thought a good place to start would be uh, some termination basics or some crop, uh, really cover crop basics in general. We'll start, Sarah will start us there. Uh, and then Mark's going to move into kind of how the pros do it. So for those of you who've been doing this a while, I think that's where you're really going to see some interesting systems that Mark will present uh, and what he's using out in his area. And then we're going to go into how can you maximize your herbicide use? Ron's going to talk about that, especially in a year like this one, where you might have to look to options you haven't had to look to in the past. So we're going to cover that. Um, and then leveraging your agronomist. Eric has some really practical tips about how logistically do we handle this and the communication that happens between farmer and agronomist. Uh, and then we'll, clo we'll uh, close with some questions. But before we do that, we're going to um, have a quick demonstration of how a carbon program might help in all of this cover crops. Uh, but enough from me. Let's get to the experts here. And starting with Sarah, I'm going to let you take things from here. Great, thanks so much. So uh, glad you got your coffee and stuff. If we wanna go to the next slide. Uh, my name is Sarah Carlson. I'm gonna go over a little bit about things to think about as we're getting started for those brand new farmers that are brand new to cover crops getting started with your spring plan. So, you know, I think our take home message for all of us today is we wanna make every drop count. And that could be because of supply chain issues or just because we wanna be judicious with spending on our inputs. My contact information is there. And if you hear something today that you want to read more about on our website, uh, a lot of the things that I'll talk about, we have research uh, reports done on our website, and you can visit those at practicalfarmers.org. So the picture there uh, might be a lot of your cover crop fields, and they're working. They're sucking up nitrogen. They're holding soil in place. But it's time to go head to the field over the next month when maybe some of the snow subsides and see how much growth we have out there and how much they've been working for us this winter so we can make sure we have a good plan. So the first thing we wanna check for is, what does our growth look like going into planting? Whether we're going to corn or we're going to soybeans, what does it look like so that we can ensure that we're prepared? So we've done some planting date studies um, with actually some of the farmers that are on this call right now, which is great to see you all. And so, you know, the later we plant that cover crop, whether it's a small grain cover crop or even those legumes, 
our spring growth is just going to be impacted by that. So here's a picture of winter rye that's uh, in an April picture planted either on the left November 20th versus October 21st. And this is from central Iowa. So, you know, if you planted late last year, your growth is going to be small and so your plan will be different. If you planted early, like especially after corn silage, you're going to have some great growth out there. Or if you overseeded and caught a rain, you're going to have great growth. So you got to be on your game and be prepared for what you've got to deal with coming up this spring. Okay, so get out there and scout that field. Next slide. <clears throat> okay, then the second thing, and this really needs to be talked about as probably a family or with your agronomist or your co-op, I'd say in February for sure, is who's going to control the spray, the sprayer? Who owns the sprayer and who can make the decisions on what needs to go through that sprayer come game time in April when we're either planting corn or planting soybeans. So it's particularly important that we get the tank mix correct, that we hit cover crops at the right time of the day, and that we are able to logistically execute well in April when we're very busy. And so it's really important to talk through that game plan in these cold winter months before it's game time. So one thing to think about is that if you own the sprayer, you can really target a field that needs to be terminated in the short window between maybe rains, for example. But if you don't own the sprayer, you may be one field out of 10,000 acres that has a cover crop for that co-op that's going to spray for you. And so you want to make sure that you're on their list and that they are prioritizing your field, especially when you're going to corn, so that things don't get messed up and that the correct tank mix is ready to go. Going to soybeans is not as big of an issue, and it's usually later in the season when we've got more spraying done, but you really need to start having that discussion now so that things work well in April. Okay, next slide. Okay, then when we're getting close to planting corn and soybeans, we need to start checking that forecast for when it's right to terminate the cover crop. Now, I'm mostly thinking about the worst case scenario of a cereal rye cover crop that's robust and it's corn uh, that we're going to follow with that crop. And we have a short window of warm up and we think it's time to spray because it's April 5th and I'm getting anxious. Well, if you saw this forecast, uh, I would really highly recommend you don't go out and spray based on this forecast because overnight lows are very cold. Day and nighttime temperatures don't add up to 100, and we need to make sure that the plant is not only actively growing, but it can actively take up that herbicide. And so we need warm weather. So I would say sometimes we need to scout, sit tight, and wait a bit until we have really good conditions so that we can make every drop count, especially when we're going to corn. Okay, next slide. Okay, now this is the time when you can kind of push yourself. If you're in that five plus range of using cover crops or even three to five years, you should absolutely be planting all of your cash crops green. And you've probably changed your nitrogen program on your corn planters so that you can plant corn into a green cover crop. And so you're going to be in the system that's on the right hand side, the ant at planting of cash crop green system. But if you're new and you're going to corn, I would highly recommend you stick with planting brown. Uh, don't push the system too much. You just want to make sure you can get good planters set up and make sure you really prioritize getting the cover crop killed and then a week to 10 days later, plant corn. If you uh, are planting soybeans and you don't have this much cover crop growth out there, I'd say you for sure could plant green if you're new. And even if it's corn and you just don't have that much growth out there, you probably can also plant green. But again, this goes back to scouting. Do we have more than six inches of growth? What's our forecast look like for getting things terminated? And how much can we stomach uh, when we're planting through this amount of residue? So those are things to sort of consider. Are we planting green this spring? Or are we going to try to plant brown? So our rules of thumb for covers to corn, I would be really careful with how much liquid is in that tank. And that could be a total of, you know, the 32% and or water. And I would really keep it less than 15 gallons. Um, and if we are thinking about using 32% as our carrier and we're going to corn and the cover crop's not very big, it's probably okay. But if that cover crop's big, we need a really good kill. And sometimes UAN in the tank can cause issues with burning the plant and then not getting a sufficient kill. So make sure we tank mix correctly and don't put too much liquid in. Make sure that we're spraying over the lunchtime when the plant is actively growing, whether we're going to corn or to soybeans. And if we have less than six inches of growth, we probably can just spray the cover and go ahead and plant corn in the next five days and we'll probably be okay 
because not too much nitrogen is held up in that rye or wheat or small grain cover crop. But if we have a lot of growth, uh, we might want to spray, delay plant a little bit and or add nitrogen in a two by two or two by dribble to the planter. Next slide. And then cover the soybeans is actually pretty easy and the best place where you can grow a lot of carbon and use cover crops as your first mode of action for weed control. So I'd really encourage planting green, even if you're brand new to covers for soybeans. Uh, you can switch up herbicides because we're usually planting in a warmer period of the time. You want to still balance liquid of the herbicide uh, ratio so you get a good concentrated rate, but then you got to have a lot of coverage on a bigger plant. So that needs to be balanced with how much liquid is in the tank. We still want to spray when the plant is growing if we are dry. But if we can get soybeans into moisture, then we're probably okay to let it grow a little bit longer, but we want to terminate probably before dough stage if we are coming into the spring dry. So like Northwest Iowa, watch out. Uh, we might wanna remove those row cleaners because it's just gonna cause us a headache and they're really not needed. Um, and then we might wanna apply our residual pre-burn down so that it can get to the ground and then do our burn down post planting, post emerge of soybeans. So hopefully some of those tips and tricks and uh, rules of thumb can get you set up with the basics for what you're going to do with cover crops uh, this season. Awesome. And Sarah, we've, we've got some fantastic questions here. Uh, some of them will be answered as we as we move along here. Uh, but but one in particular, I thought I would just ask you about real quick is, do you know, you know, Pete says he's terminating winter rye in the spring to plant alfalfa. How, uh, how long does he need to uh, wait before he plants that alfalfa? So I wish I could tell you to frost seed that alfalfa into the rye, but we just haven't had good experience with that, but you could try it. Um, I don't really, there's not going to be like an issue with rye to alfalfa, but man, if you could frost seed it, I would say that's your way because then your red, then your rye is going to really nurse crop that and really protect it. That's what we would do with red clover. We would frost seed it here mid February when we start to have a freeze thaw. Um, but if you're thinking you want to terminate and then wait, I think you should wait till like the August window for alfalfa for planting it. But that would be like after small grain harvest. All right. And I, and I know Mark is going to talk about some forages in, in his system as well in a minute. Sarah, um, Brian asks, why, why 15 gallons? This would have been on the, uh, the corn slide, I believe. So that's what's on the label usually for Roundup. And again, I would just check the label. So We've seen farmers go above 20 gallons and sometimes just not have a concentrated enough rate. And that could be an issue of like the active ingredient poundage that they're choosing. So like all that math just needs to be really on our game when we're going to corn, just because we want to get that kill to work the first time, the weather is colder. And so we don't, we need a concentrated rate. And so that's why I was just like, ner I'm nervous about more than 20 gallons for sure. And so the 15 to 20 gallon range is really where I see farmers sitting with success with termination. This is of course though, when we're going ahead of corn. And so the, the cover crop is just not as big. Ahead of soybeans, then we got to evaluate, you know, coverage, water usage, things like that. Awesome. And I want to squeeze one more question here and then the, we will move on to Mark. And, and don't worry if your question doesn't get answered right away. It might be because it's coming for sure. But uh, w one more question for you, uh, Sarah, is, is how do you act accurately ID the dough stage? Oh, so when the head is coming through the sheath, that's when we're at dough stage. So just like feel the plant and the leaves and you can even pull it back a little bit and you'll start to see that head coming through the sheath and that's dough stage. And that's when it starts to suck up a lot of water because it's going reproductive. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah, very much. We'll, we'll come back to Sarah. So if you have questions for her, keep those coming in, in the Q&A uh, icon. But let's move forward with Mark. I'm going to turn things over to you. Hey, everybody. Um, so uh, we're just going to work through, essentially what we're going to do is we're going to talk through two different scenarios that we've implemented here in, uh, in our operation. Uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to talk about a soybean scenario, and then we're going to talk about a corn uh, scenario. Um, the, uh, the advantage to what we're going to talk through is that uh, with, the, with the maturity of soybeans that we're planting, uh, you can actually have enough time to plant a multi-species cover crop after the harvest of the soybeans that includes uh, legumes so that you can have that uh, cereal or grass and legume combination so that the, the, the nitrogen from the legumes uh, is gonna benefit the corn crop. So if we can move on to the first slide there. Um, 
uh, uh, just for everyone's reference, uh, all the slides that we're going to talk about here are from the same field. Um, so just be aware of that as we move through. Uh, so we're going to talk about soybeans first. Uh, our plant date for our soybeans was April 7th. Uh, you can see there in the one picture uh, the, uh, the progress of the growth of the soybeans on April 15th. Uh, we do, uh, as you can see there, we do fully treat our soybeans except for insecticide. I know that's one thing that comes up often with cover crops and, you know, do I need to add an insecticide? Do I need to double up on my insecticide? We have actually gone to the point of removing our insecticide just so that we can uh, uh, increase uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the benefit to our beneficials and uh, having them there to help take care of things like slugs. Uh, the slide there on the right is uh, progress of the bean plants on May 2nd. Uh, you can see they're just, uh, just emerging there. And then you can also see uh, the, uh, the, the cover crop that was planted there and how it's kind of helping to protect them. Uh, um, and then also with, with the green cover crop growing, that gives uh, something green for the slugs to feed on uh, besides the soybean plant or the cash crop. Uh, next slide. So again, uh, same field. These all pictures are all from the same field. We're just going to look through the progression of the uh, of the crop here. Uh, there on the left, that is May twenty first. Um, I I had a TikTok account, and uh, one of the questions that I had from somebody in TikTok was, uh, "Isn't that isn't that seed going to go to grain?" Uh, so no, it actually does not. Uh, there there's the progress as of May twenty first. Uh, we applied our uh, we applied glyphosate on uh, May 24th. And then, um, I, then you can see the progress there uh, of the dying cover crop on June 24th. Uh, so to go back to what Sarah said, we applied our residual three days after planting. Uh, we used three ounces of Envive, and that is the only product that we applied, uh, like I said, three days after planting. So that was April 10th. Um, then came back on May 24th, applied an application of glyphosate. You can see the soybeans starting to creep up through the, the cover crop there on June 24th. And then there on the right is the progress of the soybeans on July 20th. Uh, for any skeptics out there, you can see the mountains in the background. That's proof of, uh, proof of um, that we're in the same field and it is the same year. Um, the, the benefit that we see to having this rotation is, again, we're having something green there with the cash crop uh, that helps to uh, suppress weeds. It gives slugs something else to feed on. And the amount of uh, biomass that we're creating above and below ground to build our organic nitrogen or our, our organic matter and, uh, and subsequently, uh, you know, uh, exudates that are feeding back to the roots and sugars in those exudates to help feed our our, our cash crop. Uh, so the, the next slide then that we're going to move on to is actually a, uh, a picture of the uh, the yield map from that field. Uh, you can see there that's uh, almost a 70 bushel yield advantage or yield uh, experience. Uh, we did calibrate the combine prior to uh, prior to harvesting of the field. So that is an accurate figure. Um, uh, and, you know, we are in Pennsylvania. We're going to talk about that a little bit later as far as some of the soils, you know, 70, 70 bushel maybe for some folks on here isn't, uh, isn't super fantastic, but for us, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good yield. Um, the next scenario that we're going to talk about is uh, corn. Uh, this is just one strategy uh, that we have uh, for taking care of our cover crops and, and utilizing them. Uh, for anybody that's, that's uh, in the audience today, um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're raising beef yourself or, uh, or dairy, or you have some neighbors that are, that are growing beef or dairy, um, you know, this is something that, that can help, uh, help create some additional revenue. So there on May 8th, you can see, so the, the prior year, uh, this was a short, uh, short maturity soybean, a 2.2 maturity soybean, uh, followed with a planting of Austrian winter peas, hairy vetch, crimson clover, and triticale. Uh, that would have been planted uh, late September, early October. Uh, and you can see the, the progress of the growth there on May 8th. Uh, May 10th, we would have come in and mowed that. And then there's a picture on May 12th of uh, the, the feed that was, was baled. 
Um, the, the next picture that we're going to look at is actually a, a setup of our uh, of the rear of our planter. Uh, so this field that, that the planter is in uh, is actually from a different field, not the one that we're looking at, but this is the only picture I had for an example. If you look behind the, uh, the closing wheels there, uh, there's a blue sprayer tip. So we actually apply our herbicide while we're planting the corn. Uh, that allows us to control the area that we spray, and it also allows us to uh, save an extra pass going through the field. Um, if we move on to the next slide there, we can, uh, we can take a look at how the field looks. So our plant, our plant date in this scenario was May 21st. So like I said, we mowed on May 10th, we planted on May 21st. That gives the cover crop that we mowed enough time to give a little bit of regrowth uh, so, that the, so that the cover crop actually has enough leaf surface to take the herbicide in. We use uh, Resicor and Dramoxone or glyphosate. Uh, and we're planting in a 60, 30, 60, 30, 60 pattern, which you can see there on the left. So that's the, that's the progress of the uh, plants there on July 12th. Um, the green strips in between, again, that, that helped. I, I think that was actually supposed to be June 12th. I apologize. Um, but the, uh, the, the green strips in between there, uh, that again acts as, as feed for the slugs. So rather than feeding on the, uh, the corn plants, the, the slugs are able to feed on the green strips in between. If you look hard there between the green strips, you can actually see the corn rows coming up, coming up, through, uh, coming up through there. So then what we'll do is uh, we'll look for a rain event. We, uh, we actually side dress our, our 60 inch corn with a, uh, a combination of, um, it's a Metis, which is a uh, urea and sulfur combination product. We blend that with buckwheat and radish. Uh, we've experimented with some legumes like crimson clover, uh, but planting in the middle of summer there with not great results. But uh, the other thing that you can't see there in those green strips is soybeans. So we will plant soybeans uh, in between the corn rows so that we have a legume there that's helping to produce nitrogen for the corn crop. Um, and then you can see the progress of the soybeans and the buckwheat there on August 2nd. Uh, we do have a few escapes. You can see uh, some lambs quarter in there, but uh, they are few and far between if managed, managed correctly. Uh, but the other thing that we're finding as a benefit is uh, with, with the buckwheat, it's a pollinator. So it's, uh, it's giving our beneficial insects, our pollinators, something to feed on throughout the summer. Um, and then, of course, buckwheat being a phosphorus miner, it's helping to uh, connect with the mycorrhizal and macrorrhizal fungi to help produce you know, phosphorus for the corn plant. You can see the, the uh, progress of the corn plant or the, uh, the soybean and the buckwheat plants there on the right hand side. Uh, that's, those are 54 inches tall, so, per, so producing a significant amount of, uh, of uh, biomass above, above ground there uh, to help uh, you know, with, with the overall initiative of this, which is carbon sequestration. So um, just a, a continuously green growing cycle and uh, a benefit to pollinators, to the soil, and, uh, and as you'll see in our next slide, um, uh, a benefit to our yield. So this is a, uh, this is a picture of our yield map from, from the field that we're talking about here. Um, this, is, uh, this is through Granular Insights. Uh, we were, a, as you can see there, we're, we're experiencing 188 bushel yield. Um, we were actually able to use the lasso tool there to uh, to essentially isolate the, uh, the better parts of the field and removing that red portion. Uh, for, the, for those of you who aren't aware, uh, we're actually from Pennsylvania. So we have a significant amount of deer pressure. Um, that red area there next to the woods, that was, uh, that's deer pressure. So we use that lasso tool to isolate the balance of the field and it actually uh, showed a 214 bushel yield average when we take out the deer damage. Um, so, and then for those of you who may not be impressed with 188 bushel yield, uh, this is what our Pennsylvania soil looks like. Uh, so this is what we're, what we're trying to grow corn and soybeans in. Um, so you know, we, we need something that is uh, producing uh, or helping to build organic matter 
to, to save every drop of water that we get on the fields. And uh, we're finding that cover crops are helping us to do that. Very interesting, Mark. Uh, you got the, the Q&A lighting up because I think the, everybody's really interested in kind of what you're doing, how you're doing things. Um, let me let me get to a couple of these questions. For those of you who asking about alternatives to glyphosate, especially in this year, uh, that's going to be Ron. He's coming up in just a minute. So, Ron, you're going to be very popular. Uh, stand by for that. A, a couple of uh, clarifying questions that I saw here was about uh, the soybeans. Um, where was that? Um, about your row spacing and population on your soybeans. And I can't find the question now, but I believe that's what it was. Uh, so row spacing on our soybeans, we were on 15 inch rows and uh, our, we actually put, we put down 135,000, a final stand of 119,000. All right. And um, uh, a couple questions about, um, well, here's one. Do, do you need to use a pre, um, uh, a pre-emergence on soybeans with a good cover crop stand? I would, I would recommend it, especially if you have any issues with mare's tail or any more of the, you know, some of those difficult broad leaves. Uh, but yeah, I, I would recommend a, a residual either, either a, ahead of or at planting. All right. And uh, what did you mean by control the area being sprayed? I think you mentioned that in the corn, on the corn slide. Oh, okay. So with the, uh, with the spray tips, because they're, because they're behind the, uh, because they're essentially over top of the row unit, what we're actually doing is in order to achieve that green strip, we have shutoff valves. I think you can actually see them there in the picture. Uh, we, we just shut the valve off for the row that's in between, that's the 60 inch gap. Uh, so we will plant soybeans, like I said, in that 60 inch gap, but we'll just shut that, we'll shut that row off, that row sprayer unit off, because the reservoir would not uh, wouldn't permit the soybeans to grow. All right, and and what what's the in season precipitation of the the pictures you're showing, and, and how does that compare with a normal year? Cool. Good question. Uh, I'm sorry, I I I don't know. Okay. Um, yeah. No, no problem. Man, we've got a lot of interest here, Mark. So I appreciate it. I'm going to ask you one more, and then I do want to move uh, move on to Ron because Ron has a lot of questions already waiting for him. Um, but uh, do you worry about the buckwheat maturing to hard seed and becoming a weed to the following crop? Uh, absolutely not. I actually, that's actually our goal. Um, we we had a scenario a couple of years ago where we uh, where we had buckwheat that we had that we had planted for the intention of harvesting, uh, but uh, a really wet fall delayed us from doing that. Uh, the buckwheat went to seed. It went flat. It came back, it actually grew back the following spring. It overwintered, it, well, the seed overwintered. And then uh, we planted right into that in the, uh, in the spring. And we actually left a check strip, a significant check strip. And we, I have a picture of that here, but uh, the buckwheat was the same height as the corn and there was zero yield difference where we had left the buckwheat grow. But we, we did not, make a single herbicide application to that. The buckwheat actually suppressed the lamb's quarter um, and yeah, to, with really tremendous, tremendous results. So no, I'm not, not worried about the buckwheat at all. The buckwheat actually makes a really good companion for the corn. Right. Okay, well, if you still have more questions for Mark and Sarah, we're gonna come back to them, but I do wanna to get to Ron because he does already have questions waiting for him to talk about what, what to do with limited uh, herbicide supply. So um, let's uh, hand things over to Ron Geis. All right, thank you. Um, I am gonna point out that on this panelist, you have three very astute cover crop experts. And then you've got me who knows not that much about cover crops, but I do know quite a bit about uh, chemicals. Um, we'll slip ahead here, but what we're really going to focus on in the next few minutes is to prioritize our chemical usage and, and really try to look at ways we can stretch that glyphosate supply because glyphosate is such a key part of making um, cover cropping work. But then again, with the situation this year, what are some of the alternatives? And we'll go into that. But before we move on, before we move on, I mean, jump back there. Sarah had brought up a couple of things. And, and after looking at the um, um, how, how many of you are brand new to cover crop? 
I'd be remiss if I didn't mention one cover crop termination and the rest of you, I'm, I'm waiting for the collective gasp. But if your plan is that you're going to be tilling those fields before you plant your crop, tillage is also an effective way to terminate the cover crop. It, it might take two tillage passes depending on the size of your cover crop. But if that's your plan anyway, that you will be tilling those fields, use your tillage to eliminate this year's cover crop. Now, I know those of you that have been doing cover crops for a while would not, not ever consider doing that. But if you're new to it, it is an option. So for the rest of you, we wanna focus on making those chemicals work uh, and work right. One of the things that Sarah brought up, the, the uh, Practical Farmers of Iowa, um, was to keep those glyphosate or keep those water rates low. And let me explain what's kind of going on there. When we think of, of Roundup, of glyphosate, it has a very strong negative charge. And when you think of water, especially hard water, you've got a strong positive charge. So calcium, magnesium, even hydrogen have a positive charge. So what happens when you have two ends of a magnet, a positive and negative, they get latched together. And the more water you have, the more calcium, magnesium, uh, hydrogen, the more positive you have, the more the negative and the positive hook together, the less herbicide that you have available to go into the crop. So one good way to fix that is not use so much water. I wanna point out Roundup glyphosate is the only chemical at which lower and lower and lower water volumes are beneficial as far as foliar uptake. Virtually everything else, more water is better, okay? Now to maximize our glyphosate, another thing I wanna point out, I think some of you are familiar with uh, water conditioning agents. And what do you know about a water conditioning agent? You wanna put that into your mix right away so that it's conditioning all that water. And I think most everybody does that and does that well. But I think where we fall off, we continue to add water to our mix. And as it starts to mix in with the conditioner, it's getting conditioned and, and safening it. But what happens if we have that tank only about half full and that's where we add our glyphosate, which could tie up with the new water that comes in we're not getting the thorough amount of conditioning prior to the glyphosate. If you want to help your cause, add your glyphosate at the very end when 99% of the total water volume is already conditioned in that mix, not when only half of it is conditioned, because you have about a 50-50 chance uh, that you're going to have tie-up um, as to whether the conditioner got to that water or the Roundup got to that water first. Okay, we can move on now. So as I prioritize glyphosate in my farm operation, I see five places where we are routinely using glyphosate. And if I've got a very limited supply, I've got to pick and choose. The first place that I'm going to pick and choose is to prioritize my glyphosate use on that grass cover crop. There are alternatives, we'll cover that a little later, but nothing that quite does what glyphosate does on a grass cover crop. The second priority I'm going to give it is post-emerge in soybeans. The big reason for that one is, as far as a post-emerge use on beans, we are probably, in the absence of glyphosate, we are probably only using one mode of action to control weeds. You know, if it's enlist beans, that one mode would be enlist. If it's dicamba beans, that one mode's dicamba. If it's neither, that one mode is, you know, Flexstar, Cobra, Blazer. So one mode of action is going to lead to problems in the short term because you've only got one chemistry working for you and definitely in the long term. I mean, we don't have to think back 20 years ago when it was nothing but Roundup, 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 and now, you know, now we've got what, what we have because we gave it that single mode. So putting that second mode post-emergent soybean to me is the next most important. The problem is it's also the last application you make of the year. So if you used it up before then, you just may be without. So let's draw a hard line between number two and number three, post-emergent corn. I think we can get by without glyphosate post-emergent corn to a very large extent. I'll cover that in the next slide. But two other spots where 
I'm going to say we may be wasting glyphosate today, and that's burning down where there is no grass. So the the uh, the parts that I've been working, you know, north northwest Iowa and into Nebraska, that we routinely do not use glyphosate as a burn down uh, because up here foxtail doesn't germinate, barnyard grass doesn't germinate until about the time when the crops are starting to emerge, if not later. If I don't have an annual grass there, I don't need glyphosate in my burn down. Everything else is broadleaf weeds that can be controlled with my residual plus 2,4-D plus an, a, a crop oil. And then the number five here, if I'm putting a high rate of fertilizer out and you know we're back to this thing with that fertilizer where they're gonna wanna tie together, normally when I've done that, I've doubled my rate of Roundup. Well, I don't wanna do that this year when it's so short and so expensive. So how, let's move on. How can I um, maximize and stretch that glyphosate supply? Kind of give you the cutesy little stretch Armstrong stretching that supply. Where I find the easiest way to do this is to use full labeled rates of my pre-emerge herbicides. I think a lot of you on the call may be thinking, well, I've been using full rates all along. Chances are you probably haven't for the last 20 years because the trade has typically recommend about a three quarter rate of a residual herbicide, especially in corn, knowing that if there are a few escapes that the Roundup's gonna clean it up anyway. And you know, when Roundup was cheap, you know, we just routinely went out with three quarters of a rate. Bump that up to a full rate, probably gonna cost you another $5 an acre, but uh, considering the price of glyphosate and the supply of glyphosate, that, that $5 may be pretty cheap in the long run. When I do use a post-emerge product, I want to make sure that I also have a residual material with my post-emerge. That just helps keep things clean longer. Now, we've routinely been doing that in corn with the resicores and callistos and atrazines and things like that. But in soybeans, we really haven't been doing that re religiously. Now, more are starting to do it with things like Dual and Everprex and Warrant to help get residual further into the season. But we need to be doing that especially if we're cutting back on glyphosate. Apply your post-emerge early. So one of the benefits of applying early is any weeds that are up are easier to kill because they're small. There's not much biomass to have to kill. Another benefit is when I apply early, the vast majority of my chemical hits the soil. And remember the one before there to have a residual? you're going to get maximum effectiveness of your residual if it hits the soil and not get tied up in the, the crop or not get tied up in the, in the weeds. Here's where adjuvants come in. An adjuvant is put into the mix to help spread and stick and get as much of that chemical into the plant as you possibly can. If I'm using limited amounts of glyphosate, I want to make sure every drop can get into that plant that we can possibly get in. Uh, scout your fields. No grass, no gly. If I don't have, in corn especially, if I don't have grass up, I'm going to forego the glyphosate. And substitute, we'll cover here in just a second, but, but one last thing is uh, save your glyphosate for the borders in corn. Uh, that's probably where 80% of your weeds are, and we can get by with 10 or 20% or 5% of the total glyphosate. Okay, let's move one more. Here's some alternatives, but as I look at these alternatives to kill cereal rye, look at the far right column. Okay, we're seeing two inch, three inch, four inch, maybe six inch uh, weeds that are, or, I'm sorry, rye that we're able to kill. Nothing that looks like, you know, I can kill one foot tall, two foot tall rye. That is strictly for glyphosate. Okay, let's move to the next slide. If I don't have grasses up, you know, between 2,4-D and dicamba, we're getting a very broad spectrum of broadleaf activity. And if you have specific broadleaves, a uh, lot, lot of large seeded ones like peas and things, or, or alfalfa, uh, stinger, that's, that component of sure starter reservoirs all play effective as well. All right, I, I think that covers this topic. Ron, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. We do have a couple questions here about uh, clethodim. Clethodim, excuse me. If you're if you're using glyphosate to terminate a grass like rye, would clethodim be a cost-effective alternative? 
Well, I would have said it would have been cost effective, but it's the price has gone up two to four times uh, from a year ago. So what happened is in in the uh, fall application market with glyphosate shortage, a lot of people went to Clethodum this past fall to knock out things, you know, grasses in the fall in some of those southern states and used up a whole bunch of the supply. Supply and demand kicked in, price of Clethodum doubled, you know, it's gone up again, it might be triple or quadruple. Uh, and notice six inch uh, cereal rye is, is the labeled height. All right. Well, thank you, Ron. More questions for you coming in the Q&A. But I, I want to get to Eric here real quick, because, uh, you know, what you hear over and over and over again is, uh, you know, agronomy is great, but but logistics kind of tends to trump agronomy when when the rubber meets the road. And so uh, Eric's got some great um, perspective for us about logistics and communication when it comes to making these systems work. And then uh, hold tight, because we're going to get to more of your questions here um, after Eric. <laughs> Thank you, Tim, and good morning, everyone. Uh, the biggest thing that I want to, uh, I guess, get across today is any decision to include cover crops into your agricultural uh, practice has got to make agronomic sense. Mark and Sarah and, and Ron talked a lot about how to terminate the cover crops, and, and every approach is I've seen with success. But the cover crops itself has got to make an ag agronomic sense. And, and that's somewhat undefined, and it's different for everybody's operation. It could be erosion control. It could be uh, compaction with the picture that Mark shared. Um, it could just be general weed control, uh, in-season weed control. But anything we do with cover crops cannot supersede the success of our cash crops. You know, there's a question about alfalfa, corn and soybeans. Um, it just cannot override that. Um, for, from, my, from my perspective, um, the termination piece is, is where you start in formulating your cover crop plan. And then you move backwards. You, uh, uh, you make a plan, you make a plan B, you make a plan C. We got thrown a huge monkey wrench this year um, with supply of glyphosate and other herbicides. And then not only with the supply, but then the cost. Just having a tremendous amount of, uh, of uh, uh, contingency plans in place to make sure that, that you're um, in line with success. The other thing, uh, I guess, if you just go to the, the first slide, just a, a, a picture of different uh, stand establishment uh, and of corn and soybeans in cover, cover crops is what is, the, what is success? And I think in, in uh, the context of this discussion, the uh, success of cover crops is meeting all the requirements of a carbon-based program while achieving APH or greater yields with your cash crop. Um, and, and that's where a lot of like Sarah and myself come into play is we've got to start planning early, having the end in mind and working backwards from there. Limited experience with cover crops in the first year is way better than a catastrophe in yield performance uh, after the fact. And that, those experiences are where guys swear off cover crops forever. And it uh, doesn't matter what uh, carbon initiative we have, it, it just, uh, it's hard to get back. If you wanna flip down maybe two slides right here. This is uh, the biggest thing I get involved with, usually after the fact, is stand establishment issues in, in different environments. And stand establishment most generally are directly correlated to yield. And you, you just look at these two photographs. We have uh, the team ground pound and then potentially go into team planting green. And maybe a picture that could be in the, in the middle um, is just no-till. And, and, and no-till might be the gateway drug to get from team ground pound to uh, team planting green. Both can be very, very successful. Um, but there are a lot of things in play whenever we start adding a tremendous amount of ground cover with cover crops. Um, insects, I, I know that they're, uh, uh, Mark referred to slugs. And um, a couple comments with slugs would be, Termination timing, not just termination success, has a big influence on slugs and what I've seen. 
Um, and I wholeheartedly agree with him. It's, it's leaving some of that cover green to allow slugs to feed on so that your emerging cash crop can survive. If you terminate early with slugs and, and your cover is already uh, dead or decaying, the slugs are gonna feast right on that seedling crop. And that's where we have a lot of issues. Um, there was also uh, another uh, comment I'd make is about voles. Voles have become a tremendous uh, pest in some of these situations. And termination timing uh, has a big influence on, on just vole population. And, and that might be quite the opposite. Maybe we have to kill early. Maybe we have to really reduce the amount of cover we have out there to ensure that we don't have um, added habitat for the voles while they're on the surface, habitat away from natural predators, hawks or foxes or owls, what have you. Um, and so there's opposite ends of the spectrum whenever we start talking about success with termination, but knowing the pests or the challenges that are going to be in place. Um, but it all boils down to stand establishment. The picture on the left, if we have stand establishment issues in a non-cover crop clean till scenario, it's easy to fix. We call the field cultivator guy back, we get in there, we, we wipe it out, and we start over. Stand establishment issues in a cover crop scenario is, is a whole different animal. And whenever myself, Sarah, uh, get called after the fact, sometimes we are making the best worst decision for the scenario. And that's where the plan A, B, and C have to be in place to be successful. Um, and so just, just having a plan in place for general logistics and communication to be successful. There's, there's a whole litany of different ways to terminate cover crops, the species involved, but it all has to fit into your system. Uh, go on ahead, uh, just as we tie together uh, cover crops in the, in the Corteva Carbon Initiative, Cover crops are just a portion of that uh, carbon initiative. And go on to the next slide. Um, introducing cover crops into that system, reducing tillage, improving nitrogen use efficiency are all different ways to recoup carbon dollars. Um, and cover cropping is just a subset of that. And the, and the carbon initiative is a way to offset those costs in the system. But also, if you're already using cover crops, why not capitalize on these addition, this additional revenue stream? It just it, it would just make sense. And there's a lot of ways to include cover crops. But again, limited exposure, limited, uh, I guess, getting your feet wet the first year for guys that answered that first poll initially, zero to two years. Um, maybe that first couple of years, we just we just get into it and figure out. And then we get more exposure and experience to get into what Mark was talking about and how to implement different herbicide options, what, what Ron got into. Uh, and then lastly, if you're, if you're interested in learning more about uh, the carbon initiative and cover crops, uh, scan the QR code, get more information, learn how these uh, carbon dollars uh, can maximize the ROI on your farm. Excellent. And we got a poll question that just popped up here real quick. Uh, if you would like to learn more about uh, Corteva's carbon initiative, uh, go ahead and just select uh, yes or no on that poll. Uh, so go ahead and turn your attention to that right now. And I want to get to some of these questions because I know we're going to be running tight on time because there's some really good ones in here. Um, first, I want to combine a couple questions for you, Sarah, um, about using a roller crimper. Um, and then, you know, also if you could, I know you answered the question in the chat, but maybe speak to the, um, those who are organic producers, um, their options as well. And let's try to make this Q and A as, as, uh, popcorn like as we can. So we can try to get through as many of these questions as possible, um, as we close, but I'll turn that over to you, Sarah, with the roller crimping and the organic questions. Okay, great. So on Practical Farmers website, we've done a number of roller crimp by soybean planting date studies and roller crimp date by one soybean planting date. And so the long and short of it is if you're willing to wait past pollination and you really have to wait past pollination for the small grains, especially, then you can get a good kill with a roller crimper. To set that up though really well, you need to be planning in the fall to plant like at a three bushel or more rate so that you get like less tillering and really thick uh, lots of individual plants 
so that when you crimp it post Memorial Day, which is Central Iowa date when we would do it, you really get an easy way to kill it. But you don't want like pollen blowing onto the radiator. If you're if you're getting pollen on the radiator, you need to really wait a couple more days because you're going to have plants that come back up because rye is a population. Now, maybe triticale would be more uniform, and so you could roller crimp that. But the feed is expensive, and that's usually better for forage. Then we've messed around with soybean planting date around that roller crimp date, and it really seems to work best to plant soybeans after roller crimp date. And this would be especially good for an organic system. Uh, for organic farmers, really with cover crops, I'd say small grains plus red clover and then tillage to corn is probably the best way to get nitrogen out of that cover crop and terminate it. And then you would plant corn a month after that red clover gets to break down so you don't get uh, insect issues on your corn. And then roller crimp rye to organic soybeans. I did it fast. You did great. A plus for that. Um, and uh, for those of you asking about will this be recorded, it will. You can't. You will be able to be sent a link if you're registered for it. The Q and A, the written Q and A, I don't believe is accessible though. So if you if you want to, if there's something in particular you want there, you might want to find that right now yourself. You should. I think I think it should be um, available if you click on answered, although I don't know if that's only for me as a moderator, but I, I think that's there for you right now. I don't know that that comes in a video form. Um, all right, for those interested, we have a few questions about um, planting corn green. And Mark, you know, is that something that you can speak to a little bit? I know that uh, that uh, Sarah had mentioned when we started that maybe if you're just starting out, maybe that's not what you want to do. But uh, for those who maybe have some experience, Mark, what are your thoughts there? Uh, yeah, we've we've been planting green for a, a number of years now. Um, uh, yeah, trying to think of what to say there. Uh, been planting green for a number of years. We really like planting into legumes. Um, you know, we we started out with rye. You know, probably fifteen years ago. Uh, moved past that. We we like the option of triticale. Um, we like the option of triticale winter peas. Winter peas, provided that they are planted deep enough, uh, you can plant them well into November um, and still get growth, but that's the biggest key is making sure that they're planted deep enough. Uh, we also like to use uh, crimson clover and hairy vetch. Uh, so to go back to the previous question about roller crimping, hairy vetch, if if allowed to go, if allowed to, to reach significant growth, will, will basically crimp on its own as you take the planter, just the planter across it. Um, but that, but it has to have enough growth in order to be able to do that. Um, so yeah, we've been planting green for years. What we've, what we have done, I uh, can't speak, you know, I don't want to tell anybody what to do, but we took off our row cleaners. We started out with row cleaners. We took them off. Uh, we don't have, the only thing we're running on our planters is a double disc opener. That's it. Uh, we want, we want every pound of that planter to be focused on uh, the, the row unit of the planter to, to get consistent depth, consistent depth of the seed and weight to be able to cut through that green residue. And there's the advantage of the green residue is uh, that it slices you know pretty easily. Uh, and then the other thing that I think I'd, I'd like to mention is just be cautious of seeding rates. Um, you know, depending on what scenario you're heading into, uh, I think one of the one of the worst things that can be done, especially with cereal rye, is if you get that cereal rye planted too thick. Uh, be be cautious of that. And th there were a few questions. I think maybe Sarah might have answered a few of them, um, typed an answer, but I want to talk about it uh, for everybody's benefit. Is uh, res residuals when you're planning on interseeding into corn? you know, considerations for that, or maybe Ron, maybe you answered a couple of those. Ron, you want to start on that? And then if, if anyone else has anything to add, go ahead. You know, what are the considerations there? What do they need to be worried about? Okay, uh, Tim, I'm going to interject maybe a little programming note here. On the Q&A, if you go in and click on the upper link that says answered, and then show all, in a lot of cases, I, I hope I can, maybe hopefully you can as a participant, you can see the answer to your question if one of the panelists have already answered the question. Just want to point that out. Maybe, Tim, if we can keep it open after we're done, people can go through and look, look at those. Okay, back to the question. What are we trying to do when we kill the existing cover crop? We're, try, we're trying to get as much chemical into that cover crop as we possibly can to get the best control of that cover crop that we possibly can. What are we trying to do with a residual? 
we're trying to get as little of that chemical as we possibly can into the cover crop. So the more of it goes down into the soil. So everything we're doing to maximize our cover crop termination works against getting residual herbicide. So your best uh, way to get residuals into the program is to put them on earlier before you've terminated the cover crop. Or if your cover crop is gonna be terminated early, like for those of you that want to plant brown, wait at least a week for that cover crop to you know, essentially be dead, even though it may not look dead, but, but wait for it to get, um, you know, for, for that to no longer be uptaking that residual chemical as you put that out. All right. All right. We are, we're coming up on the top of the hour here. A lot of great questions. I will tell you, keep those questions coming because even if we don't get to them on this webinar, we actually structured this webinar around the questions that were asked on the last one. So, um, you know, I, I, for, for our benefit and for yours, keep the questions coming and we want to make sure we direct the, the webinars that we do have um, to what you're interested in. But I want to give each of our panelists one final chance to give kind of just a one minute, either, um, either kind of take away from this and or um, if you want to grab one of the questions that's still out there unanswered, um, you can do that. But maybe just one minute each and we'll go in order of presentation. So Sarah, that means you start. So there was a lot of interest in interseeding like V4, V6 corn. And I would just say, if you're like south of Highway 90, uh, you need to either reduce your corn population or widen your spacing if you really want robust cover in the interseeding window, which is like the June window. If you're sort of north and you can get sunlight into that canopy, um, then interseeding works. So I'd just be cautious, wasting a lot of money on very expensive like legume seed and that interseeding window herbicide plan aside, just literally there's no sun into a heavy corn population. So check that. And then two, always take like an 80 acre field and just play around or maybe 40 acres and do something new every year. So try to plant green maybe this year on a small chunk of something, or maybe try to take cover uh, corn or soybeans off as early as possible in the fall so you can mess around with maybe a legume or camelina or something other than rye going to corn. But we always have to learn, and cover crops have been primarily driven by farmers learning and sharing, and this is how we're going to figure all this out and answer all those questions. So I encourage you to try something new every year on a small plot and then share that information with other farmers. Thank you, Sarah. Mark? Uh, I'm going to piggyback right on top of what Sarah uh, finished with there, and that is share that with other farmers. Uh, I think that's that's probably been the biggest benefit in, in our area. Uh, we had, you know, started out with a peer group of about uh, eight, 10 guys, uh, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, and that's that's the point now where we have what we call uh, town hall meetings uh, to the point where we can't invite everybody that wants to come because there's so much interest in it. Uh, so, so number one is just find those peers that you can work with, that you can share ideas with. Uh, there's no such thing as too crazy of an idea. Um, I, I agree with, with Sarah, you know, try it small, although, I would say try large enough, try an area that's large enough that you're invested in it so that you're going to do it right. You're going to think it through. And, and then also don't be afraid to fail because you will have something that doesn't go right. Um, but that's, that's kind of the, the, you know, that's, that's the outcome of all this is thinking outside the box. It doesn't look like the norm, uh, mm -hmm. you know, avoid the coffee shop if you have to, um, because they're going to talk about you if you if you're growing you know lots of different legumes and it's going to blossom and it's five feet tall and you're trying to plant through that, uh, they're they're definitely going to be some naysayers. But uh, give it you know give it time, uh, share with like-minded people, and 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 you'll start to experience the benefits. They're going to talk about you anyway. Might as well make it interesting, right? Um, Ron, your turn. 30 years ago, we used a highly integrated approach to weed control. We worked our soil, we cultivated, you know, we walked our fields, we hand pulled weeds. And in the last 20 years, we've done almost none of that. To me, the integration of a cover crop system is as close as we can get in modern agriculture to emulate what we used to do with a lot of labor. A lot of those same benefits of tillage or intra-row cultivation or even roguing can be offset 
by properly integrating a cover crop system into our overall plan as far as weed control is concerned. All right, Eric, and you're going to get the final word. Thank you, Ron. Undoubtedly, there's participants on the call who are interested in cover crops because they want to. There's probably also participants on the call who are having to do cover crops because of a landowner or other outside uh, influence. Carbon programs provide added dollars to help offset the cost of cover crops. Make a plan, make alternative plans. Um, align yourself with an agronomist or consultant to execute on those. Be uh, cognizant of, of undoubted, unexpected pests and risk, uh, and we can be successful. There's multiple ways to get to the same end goal. Excellent. Yeah, I, I know there was some uh, questions on the carbon program. That's not the focus of today's webinar, but encourage you to uh, to reach out and ask those questions because I know that's a a uh, constantly evolving um, area of the industry. So so reach out and ask those questions. Thank you so much, panelists. That was fantastic. We did it. We made it in an hour. I think we got some great stuff in there. And thank you so much for all of your questions. We really hope to uh, guide the conversation based on those questions. And hopefully we can do another one of these and answer some more. Uh, so we hope to see you back then. But for now, uh, have a great day.